What's up, world? Welcome back to I Mix What I Like right here on the mighty, mighty BPM. Oh, man. A little bit of backyard band from this uh, weekend at the good MLK library, the the, the newly renovated and, and gentrified, but or gentr- for the gentrifying DC. They needed a new MLK library and... Uh, the contradictions of co-optation, because that was a great event, a great venue, but we all know what's really going on and why it's happening. So, but anyway, uh, and to Adele and Adele fans on behalf of Backyard and Go Go, I just want to say you're welcome. <laughs> anyway, all right, good people. I hope you appreciated the remix this morning, and uh, to those who are joining me live now, appreciate you. Welcome back, and to those who will see this later, thanks to you as well. Welcome back. Please like, share, subscribe, support the platform however you see fit to do so, and uh, I appreciate you for for being interested in this chapter breakdown uh, of the myth and propaganda of black buying power, uh, and you know, I almost never say this, but it occurred to me it, reading a few comments recently that that um, it might be worthy to remind folks that in the show description is a brief bio and links to more of my work and my background academically in terms of journalism and activism. Uh, I, I, I get the sneaking suspicion there's, there's a handful of people that pass through here and don't look uh, and and make certain assumptions about why I'm here, what I'm doing, and what what how I've reached my conclusions. So, um, if you do want more, or if if it's not made clear enough in the particular video that you're watching, or this one, this one maybe, go ahead and 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 check that out. All right. Uh, uh, not only because I definitely want to make way for the twelve o'clock um, episode of confronting contradictions with Coco, but uh, um, also I don't think that this chapter it will take us particularly long unless there's a conversation you all want to have uh, you know afterwards. So I'm going to leave the chat for now and um, just go through a couple of things and if you have comments, questions, critiques, queries, conundrums, catechisms, cacophony, calumny, consternation, contemplation, condemnation. I'll be back to check for it. Uh, and if if you're not live and you have any of that, uh, by all means, either send me an email uh, or or perhaps better yet, simply put it in the comments. And uh, we might be able to engage there as well. So, OK, so what I am going to do this time, because uh, I think I, I did not hold... Um, I'm going to just pull up the Kindle copy here and um, go through a couple of things. Uh, let's see. Hold on one second. Getting... Uh, uh, Okay, let me see if that worked. Okay. Um, and chapter two is is um, me just trying to give an overview that, that l- again, listening to some of the criticism might need to, in future editions, get moved ear- up earlier uh, in the book. If, if, if I come back to it, if we continue this, this, you know, uh, adventure, uh, in addition to some of the other constructive criticism, cr- uh, criticisms I've gotten, this is, I think, a good one that I need to move up some of what's in this chapter to make it make the point earlier. Though, at the same time, I understand why I didn't do it that way, and in part, it's because uh, I wanted to just address the basics of the myth 
uh, before getting into some of these details, but but I, I understand why it might be better to just go ahead and start out the gate with with some of what's in here because the the as it says in the chapter, the point is um, that uh, just starting right off the top here, the the issue in in confronting the myth of black buying power is that it's more propaganda than it is economics. And I'm starting to think that none of exactly why did what happened to all of my, what happened to all of my notes? This is twice now they've all been erased from my Kindle copy. So give me a quick second because I have them elsewhere, but essentially that was that was one of the points I wanted to highlight. This just this first line here that it, that that the issue is more propaganda than economics. The economics of it are more more or less. Uh, I don't want to say simple, but they're they're it's it's the issue is less clarifying what the actual material conditions are than explaining how they are developed and and maintained which is ultimately part of the the or the the bulk of the the or the the primary focus of this work and maybe all of my work uh but anyway so that and and again that is the financial side of the myth while nuanced and even at times complicated is relatively more easily dismissed once the fog of media and sloppy journalism is cleared so that's sort of well, that's not sort of, but that is that is the crux of the issue. And I really wish that the notes would not have, because I had like re, re, like what happened to all of them though? This, and it happened twice. This has happened twice. So that sucks. All right. But um, so as I said, I talk a little, I'll come back in chapter four to talk a little bit more about the Bureau of Labor Statistics and some of how the, the reports around buying power are constructed. But, but essentially what I'm just trying to point out here is that black people don't have any money. So whether it's looking at the, and, and that this is sort of the crux, black people are impoverished, made to be poor as part of the proper functioning of a capitalist economy. And then to 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 protect against that and to justify that, uh, that's where the messaging and the propaganda and the confusion is encouraged. Uh, so the median income for black America was reported in 2018 as $40,258. And then I just simply try to do some basic math and said that if there are roughly 40 million African Americans in the United States, uh, for there to be this popularly mythologized $1 trillion in buying power, it would mean that each and every black person would have to spend at least every single penny earned. Because if you multiply this median income by the 40 million, uh, uh, 40 million times 40,000 is 1.6 trillion. So essentially what the number, this, this buying power number is, is, an assessment of the total, and we'll come back to this when we look at the BLS reports, is is a report, the, the trillion dollars comes from a reporting of, of what all black working people earn in a year. And then from the perspective of advertisers, marketers, corporations, they want every penny of it. So that's why they're saying from their perspective, this is the power of the black worker the ability to take every penny they earn and give it right back to us. It is not an economic strength. And as I get into in this chapter, it is not income. It is not wealth. It is not a measurement of stocks. It is not a measurement of anything. That is the, the concept of buying power. It is not wedded to any real metric for the measurement of or an assessment of the economic strength of an individual or a community. So I did add this stat that that I learned in after the first edition was was published in my work uh, in in really not my work but my my working with Diedrich Muhammad, uh, uh, Jamie Buell, and others with the NCRC 
uh, and this this stat, I keep talking about it, it, it to me says everything, that from 1992 to 2012, black people created more than 2 million businesses, but their capture of national sales revenue went down from what was already just a mere 1% to 0.5%. And what that means, again, is as a measurement of national sales revenue, what they're saying is that not only do black people not have any money, but because black businesses, which we're often encouraged to develop as a response to black material inequality, target themselves black communities that don't have any money, the fact of an estab the, the establishment of black businesses does nothing to accumulate more of the sales revenue nationally spent on what is bought. Because if you're measuring what all consumers in the country spend and what they spend it on, black people having less to spend, black people being the, the primary consumers of black owned products and businesses don't have any money to bring to those businesses. So this idea, so the the establishment, the more black businesses black people create, of course it's going to it's going to it's and it, it was only one percent before. It's down to half of a percent in terms of what is is what is spent on those businesses nationally every year. And that and it, and it makes sense. The more you develop in this context the less you're going to be able to to attract uh in part because there's more competition for that for that little bit of con black consumption uh and of course there isn't much black consumption relatively speaking to to attract buying power numbers do not reflect income inequality for the fact that as of the first quarter of 2022 the median white worker made 27% more than the typical black worker and around 333% more than the median latinx worker which is wild uh similarly as i point out in this in 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 uh in this uh section that um if the racial wealth divide is left unaddressed and not exacerbated further over the next eight years, median black household wealth is on a path to hit zero by 2053, according to another report from Diedrich Muhammad and, and, and his crew. And then, as is pointed out, and I've been talking about with others for a long time now, that, that even though this country is headed to being a, a majority minority, so-called, where white people are going to be the, the minority population, uh, they still have all of the wealth, so we're just ending up in an apart headed towards apartheid, an apartheid situation that would match economically and materially uh, what others, as I've re referenced for years, have pointed out already exists in our media landscape in terms of uh, white ownership of media targeting a, a population that is increasingly non-white. Uh, so it doesn't matter that if th that numerically white people are headed towards being a minority because they will have an ever increasing percentage of the amount of wealth. Uh, and they still, as is the case in, 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 in the apartheid situation in South Africa, they will still have control over the banks and the military uh, and the political apparatus. So numbers don't necessarily mean anything. Uh, and is obviously, this is always the case when we're talking about capitalism and the extreme minority that is created in elite white men or this top one-tenth of one percent that have all the wealth. As Marissa Baradaran started off her book with, and again, I, I hear that critique, maybe I should have done the same, uh, black people still hold the one, same one percent of, of, of the wealth that was held in 1863. And, it's, and even that is headed to nothing. Uh, since 2008, the Economic Policy Institute has been reporting black people are in a permanent recession, meaning it doesn't matter how well the economy is doing. Black people are always going to be in a recession. Um, and yeah, I get, uh, uh, yeah, anyway. Uh, and then even if you believe in buying power, Uh, 
black people's buying power relative to the buying power of all the other segments of the population that are measured still only has 8% of the whole. Um, and then as Algernon Austin of the Economic Policy Institute uh, uh, talked about some years ago, there is this, this, and others have talked about obviously, but I, I like the way he did this with this black, this, the, 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 the blackness, the debit card of blackness and the cost of blackness, that, that the immaterial cost of blackness Never mind. So after all of the already covered inequality in terms of income and wealth and all of that is the immaterial cost of blackness that involves incarceration, police violence, surveillance, media related trauma, health care uh, uh, and more. And then my favorite quote that I've referenced all the time ever since I first read it in this in the classic uh, 1999 book, A Strangers and Neighbors, which is a collection of essays about the relationship of black people to Jews. Uh, Derek Bell has has this incredibly powerful quote. If the nation's policies towards blacks were revised to require weekly random roundups of several hundred blacks who were then taken to a secluded place and shot, that policy would be more dramatic, but hardly different in result than the policies now in effect, which most of us feel powerless to change. And having had the chance to meet Bell briefly and ask him specifically about this, because when I first read this quote in 1999, given what I thought I knew of Derek Bell at the time and his stature within academia, I couldn't believe that someone like him would say something like this. So a couple of years later, when I got to meet him and ask him, and he just kind of looked up over over his eyeglasses at me and, 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 and looked up at me and said, well, it's true, ain't it? And I was like, yeah, I'm just saying I can't believe you wrote it, though. Like, the, the truth of it is irrelevant. We all know truths get unspoken all the time. Uh, but you and all your stature wrote it. And, 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 and I just thought that was, you know, and, and in a book specifically to point out the, the, the cavernous differences, important differences in terms of the, the experiences of black people to Jews in this country. Uh but again, it, but for me, again, in terms of the context of this work, it it it's important because ultimately, as we get to when I conclude, I'm saying we need a public policy. We need to address ourselves to public policy as an expression of the political power I ultimately want us to have, which is the ability to define phenomena and have it act in a desired manner. So, but the point being that that it's it's also to say that this this incessant focus that is again imposed on us that we have to do it strictly through business development and circulating dollars and all this is part of the is is the nonsense that that i i love that this quote addresses uh, uh by saying no this is a public policy issue and the public policy that redirects resources that that determines Everything from pay to definitions of crime to who will be punished to to how wealth is defined and redistributed. All of that is a policy issue. It has nothing to do with get your money right and then we can have power. No, it's the that's the exact opposite. And that's what Bell is pointing to in this quote. Uh, let me just let me get back to my notes since the highlights are gone. Um I would have wanted to to uh, include, which I've made reference to more um, in terms of the discussion of the wealth issue, is that report that we covered here from the National Bureau of Economic Research that talked about the Darren Court report paper that talked about uh, the the fact that because of the the beginnings of enslavement, black people can never hope for anything better than basically what we have now, which is a six to one ratio of wealth to whites or a one to six ratio of wealth vis-a-vis -vis whites. That, and that again, in that, that, that paper, they argued that even if you remove from 1863 on all of the other racist abuses that inhibit material equality, Black people would still, because of the beginnings of, of, of enslavement and the accumulation of wealth that that allows for uh, white people, black people could only hope to ever get to a three to one ratio of wealth to white, vis-a-vis -vis whites. 
and or one to three. And obviously that doesn't that world universe doesn't exist or at least is in a parallel universe. It doesn't exist here. So in this one, the best we can hope for is a six to one gap in wealth. Uh, and I think that's and that's a again, a policy issue. So uh, uh, and that's why I, I take a few minutes here to talk about what I mean by power in terms of or what it, what they mean in terms of the word power in the phrase buying power, because it's not an assessment, again, of stocks, bonds, land, wealth. It is not something that can be flipped, renovated, improved. It, buying power is strictly the ability, a measurement of the of by corporations to assess the ability of those they're measuring to enrich the corporations themselves. Power in the phrase buying power strictly means the power consumers have to buy one available product over another. Put another way, power in the phrase buying power means only the power to generate wealth for one corporation or another or to generate wealth for someone else. So, in, in, and maybe I should have said it more in this, this way, in, in, it, is, it is no different than the power a traditional colony would have had to enrich its colonizer. That's all that buying power means in that phrase. And then, as I say here, it's primarily through the practice of popular journalism and commentary that allow the word power and the phrase buying power to lose all of its meaning. The term power is redefined to mean shopping, but, but works to confuse potentially powerful communities and, and energies into what advertisers want most, which are consumers whose acts of generating wealth for others are magically redefined into a concept of individual and collective political, economic, or social power. Um, and part of what protects this, as I'll come back to later in the book, is is this apparatus of, you know, that I've I've just sort of represented here in these names, but this is the 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 media environment that over the over decades and and to today has helped create this echo chamber, starting with John H. Johnson, who we'll talk more about later in the book, uh, who developing this, 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 the, 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 this perspective that movement into the black middle class and the capture of, and the attraction of ad revenue and marketing revenue from corporations to black owned media, this was, this was the power uh, 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 or the black participation or the black um, complicitness with the, the, the state's desire to rebrand black power and civil and human rights struggles as black middle class, black capitalism. Then, of course, it's picked up through the NNPA, the National Newspaper Publishers Association, which is the largest array of black press uh, the 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 um, sort of the umbrella organization of the black press, Roland Martin, Earn Your Leisure, Million Dollars Worth of Game, Ian Dunlap, all the you know, and and going back some years, Tavis Smiley, Tom Joyner, Karen Hunter, Hill Harper, who's now running for Senate, Steve Harvey, Dr. Julianne Malvo, and others have been you know, Urban League. They've all been running uh, uh, the buying power mythology and helping promote it for a long time. Uh, I do introduce a little bit here how the journalism side works in this, uh, particularly the black press, uh, with an example here from uh, um, Philadelphia journalist um, uh, Michael Cord, again, talking about the, the, that, 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 that black buying power uh, and reparation was, well, in this case, was raised in defense of reparations, it's, you know, uh, and this call to build another black Wall Street, uh, saying that buying black reinforces... Uh, efforts from civil rights, you know, um, and then reduces black struggle to a focus on black capitalism. So that's part of the journalistic process here. So if the black press in this case or other commercial presses make reference to Booker T. Washington, Marcus Garvey, Du Bois, 
it's almost always in the context of um, their business endeavors there or or maybe with Du Bois, they just reduce him to the 1903 color line statement and 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 just it's a narrowing uh of the reference so even here in an NPR story that I referenced they're they're talking about Marcus Garvey and Booker T Washington but in the context of building wealth for their community and black capitalism so it helps from both the black press the mainstream white press it helps create this again this this echo chamber that that misleads audiences into thinking that actual economic uh, ec- actual economic power is what's being described in this this discussion of buying power. And what Earl Ofari described in the myth of black capitalism as economic nationalism uh, is part of the mythology that there are people who assume, as Marissa Baradaran talks about, that that because a segregated community is segregated, that it can, along the lines of some nationalism, nationalist discourse, evolve its own independent economy, and you can't do that. It doesn't work that way, which is, again, why Che wanted to extend the revolution of Cuba beyond the Cuban borders, which is why Nkrumah understand that, that the freedom of Ghana required the freedom of all the other and really a destruction of the, 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 the states created by European and colonialism. But uh um reduced in the opposite direction it gets it gets turned into uh we can business our way out of our oppression uh so i point to some of the early and i and i i think i could have organized this better i i struggled with it even trying to redo it for the second edition um there's some reorganization that occurs that i i, I think helps but i i in general struggle with it which is connected to this other issue of where in the book should I put the stats and all of this? I, I've always struggled with organizing my thoughts and having them clearly arrayed uh, and aligned on, on in print. But uh, so I was trying to point to this twenty or cha- turn of the century, twentieth century moment, just very quickly, where I come back to in another chapter to talk more about the cost of living surveys. But to point out that this 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 concept of economic nationalism, buying power, et cetera, has an old, very old history. Going back to the first black woman law professor, who in 1897 is talking about the degradation of black buying power and a need for black consumers uh, and businesses to be more respected. And this ethic evolving into Booker T. Washington's National Negro Business League, um, and and again, matching with the eventual rise uh, with with the not the eventual, but the well, really the concomitant rise of state sponsored cost of living surveys, which themselves have a very again political goal of assessing the pressure point, the breaking point uh, for labor. At what point can you are they paid too little to be able to function within the economy and to not rebel? Um, so, uh, but then here, as Garrett, uh, Garrett Scott points out, uh, and I really do like this summary. Because I'm talking about this turn of the 20th century moment, this early 1900s moment, and then as, as they summarize here, by the end of World War I, two clear variants of how to achieve an independent black economic nation dominated the historiography. The first focused on African-American business development and entrepreneurial leadership, and the second on leveraging African-American consumer buying power as grassroots leadership and grassroots leadership. In practice, however, the two strains often overlapped. People spent their money and participated in separate group economy in ways that crossed such intellectual categories. But the point is, just as is the case today, so again, I'm just trying to quickly 
trace the history of why people think the way they think today and then fill in the gaps in terms of the media messaging and the propaganda and some of the political interests involved, how that message got became this way. So we're, we're well over 100 years now of the dominant narrative of how to achieve black independent black economic independence not political independence not liberation is by leveraging consumer buying power and it's it's a fundamental misunderstanding of the economy and how it works that is again imposed and encouraged because at no point has it ever been encouraged that black people actually achieve political independence, power, sovereignty, et cetera. So when people tell me, as just happened literally within the last, I think, 72 hours, but it happens all the time. We don't need your argument, Jared, because we've tried all of that. What we haven't tried is getting our business da 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 So we need to get our buying power together. And I'm saying, no, your argument is the tired old argument that has been imposed on the more effective work of liberation. So as I'm continuing here, so popular with the concept of, of, of buying power become that the, that the idea that black consumption equated in, in, in any way to legitimate, I'm sorry, so popular with the concept become the idea that black consumption equated in any way to legitimate forms of political power. It, according to Abram Harris, since the depression won over a growing number of adherents. The growth of the mythology would, would include attendant sloganeering from bigger and better Negro business, don't buy where you can't work, control over the black dollar. Today we have buy black, bank black, hashtag this, circulate the black dollar. But in spite of, well, I'll, no, I'll come back to that, but, but and it, well, what I was going to say is in spite of, of, again, this hundred years of these slogans, we have the same conclusions previously mentioned of no black wealth. So again, this is the old tired argument that doesn't work. Not, not those of us who, 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 who call for different forms of, of struggle. It's those other forms of struggle that are more effective, which is why this one has been imposed on us for, for more than 100 plus years now. And why I did think, I still think it's funny that, that Garvey, in the, in, the, in the middle of his, of, of his back and forth with Du Bois and their real petty back and forth childishness, Garvey in his pettiness, that's why you can't front him, I'm just Jared. If the great Marcus, Messiah, could be this petty, why can't I? Why should I be expected to be any better? <laughs> so he said to Du Bois, the buying power of the Negro is the most tremendous force within his reach today. And, and you know, basically saying to Du Bois, congratulations for catching up to what I've been trying to tell you. And yet they were both wrong on that one point. So then what I do here, and then I made a note that one of the flaws of this section and my work here is that I don't do anything on the specific history of the Green Book, the more famous black, black Green Book, <laughs> which I should have. And it, it, it's like sitting here saying it's basically the, it's, the door's been, the carpet's been laid for it. And what would have been perfect is if I had, oh man. What would have really been perfect is if I had taken a moment to, to big up the Vernon philosophy of black media avoidance in the context of this, of this work here. Because um, I'm going to switch this out. Because in uh, you know I talked about the film, The Green Book, 
in the context of the Vernon philosophy of black media avoidance, and the and and the point being that Mer Mer Shala Ali, I keep messing up his name, but but uh, Ali had to apologize to the family of Don Shirley because the version that he had gotten of the story that's depicted in the Green Book is entirely false, and it would have been a good chance to say to make a point about the Vernon philosophy of black media avoidance. Talk about the way the Green Book history is often mythologized in terms of this case of Hollywood, but also uh, among some uh, black historians and, 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 and believers in black economic nationalism or black capitalism, uh, and put it in the context of what I end up do saying a word or two about. Um, so that, that, that's a flaw that, that I, I, I should correct. In, if, if I ever come back in future editions. Because what I do talk about here is the 1932 work of economist Paul Edwards, which was said to be the first scholarly research that focused on so-called minority consumers um, with the goal of having it put into to service of white business interests setting in motion the relationship between black consumer marketing material black consumer marketing materials black political movement black political and social movements and white commercial interests using edwards work as its inspiration the white advertising firm wb ziff and company published the negro market in 1932 and devoted an entire rate book to the subject the negro field in 1934 Beginning in the 1920s, advertising executive William Ziff worked closely with major African-American newspapers. He also encouraged white-owned companies to capitalize on Negro buying power and to increase their volume of advertising in the African-American press. So again, I'm just trying to show some of the early historical origins of this overlapping overlap in interest between the black commercial press, the white commercial press, and eventually the state in promoting black capitalism and entrepreneurialism among black people as, as the only solution to inequality, specifically to discourage more radical options, analyses, et cetera. And in some way, as Earl Ofari points out here, is that Without the proper understanding of the American economic order, black analyses and actions cannot be m more meaningful. And that's the point that I'm trying to get at simply with this, this, this point here and why I conversations with me are often frustrated, frustrating when it comes to uh, the subject being solutions. I don't have a, 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 a succinct enough answer for what the solution are, is, and people are often not happy with my answer or explanation that what, what Earl Ofari said some decades ago is what I'm trying to say now, that our solutions are meaningless because we don't have a proper understanding of the American economic order. We don't properly understand how capitalism works. We don't understand how black capitalism works, why it exists as a concept and has been encouraged for so long in the first place. Um, and as Abram Harris says, as, as that said a hundred years ago, that its ultimate impact is to benefit a handful of black business owners to the detriment of the rest of us. And that's where I'm saying this issue of propaganda or the 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 uh, uh, comes into play. And why I really love that I found this quote from Nancy Snow, uh, a leading, longtime leading uh, uh, scholar on the history of propaganda. But when she points out that as a process of persuasion, propaganda's value is neutral. It is the intention behind the propaganda that demands scrutiny. And it is the atten intention which begs value judgments, not the propaganda itself. And that's one of the points that I've been trying to make for years that I, I, that I struggle to make, and I'm glad she put this well. Buying power mythology is in part designed with the intention of creating the confusion that it does uh, and to focus on its effectiveness 
in convincing one or another or oneself of 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 the value of, of black capitalism is beside the point. The point is that is the goal. So I say this, I'll say it later today in my class, it doesn't matter to me whether you think it's been effective on you or anyone else. I'm never making that point. I'm never arguing per se its effectiveness. My argument is around its under, as, a, as us understanding the intent of the messaging so that we can step away from is it effective or am I caught up in it or feeling this way or that way about it. No, 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 no. I just want you to be aware of us all to be aware of the the intent of the messaging. And the intent is to get us away from organization, from socialism, for from national from radical nationalism, from any of those ideas, and to strictly lock us in conceptually to freedom and struggle and activism is business and uh, and banking and investment. Because ultimately, propaganda is consciously targeted messaging meant to impact, limit, manipulate, and form public opinion. And is any organized or concerted group effort or movement to spread a particular doctrine or system of doctrines or principles? It is mass persuasion with a purpose that advantages the sender. Propaganda is also understood to have a persuasive function, intend intend to reach a sizable target audience, be representative of a specific group's agenda, and make use of faulty reasoning and emotional or emotional appeals. So everything in terms of buying power fits that definition. The intent is to reach a sizable target audience, to be representative of, of a specific group's agenda. That is, in, we could understand that as uh, the messaging of buying power is meant to represent the, the capitalist's agenda, or is meant to represent falsely the, the, the aspirations and goals of black people. And then, of course, it uses faulty reasoning and emotional appeals. You want your liberation. You want to be free, don't you? So just start a business and circulate your dollar. And it is the primary, that is propaganda, is the primary means by which the elite communicate with the rest of us. And it is, for me, a subset of what Du Bois called the propaganda of history, meant to design, meant to, to, to justify and explain why black people are held in, in, in as he put, a uh, semi-colonial status. Uh, so then I do mention here a little bit, and we can come back to it, if, um, and I would encourage people to check out the, the, the video I, I did on the science of coercion, talking about Chris Simpson's work. Uh, and the history of mass comm, and it, it really helps, I think, understand not only my own approach, but but how mass communication has been evolved in this country and what its p purpose is, uh, and will help explain, I think, a little bit more of, of my own argument in this book. But essentially, the point is that the the very messaging brought to Black America is is designed with the same background intent that psychological warfare efforts were designed in colonial struggles abroad uh, and warfare abroad. So it's not to be taken lightly. And then some of it, at least in the in the material sense, is so that would be the, what I just said was the immaterial. The material sense is to catch as much of this. Uh, these billions that are spent on ads every year that the commercial press, black, white, or other wants, wants a part of um, what just the top 200 ad buyers spent in 2018. And there's many more hundreds of ad buyers. Uh, I've seen the total projected number upwards around five or 600 billion in terms of all the ad revenue that's flying around out there. But 163 billion is, is, is quite a lot that that everybody wants a piece of so to do that there needs to be this false projection of the ability of black consumers to buy what is being advertised in press targeting them and that's it that's essentially it for that chapter uh it's more or less it's kind of like a summary of the overall argument uh, and it's meant to 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 start to prepare the reader for understanding that just that 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 buying power is messaging. It's not it's not real. It's not based in anything 
economic, uh, it's not based on anything that would be used to assess economic condition of, of a people or a community. So, um, so that's it. I'll stop there and I'll jump back in the chat. If there's any questions, comments, or, or criticism or anything, please uh, um, recycle it back to the top. Uh, super chats do get highlighted automatically and, uh, and we can chop it up for a few minutes. Otherwise, we have plenty of time to make room for confronting contradictions with Coco at 12 o'clock. Um, but I hope that makes some sense. Uh, you know, um, but yeah, I don't think, and I, it looks like they're not. So I guess, I guess we're all clear. The chat is often on its own superior level anyway. Um, yeah, go ahead and hit the like button, you know, if you would. Share, subscribe, do all those things. Uh, and um, okay, Craig, there's more scholarship about black debt that might be incorporated into this argument, the focus on black income, but when you're going to the title company using credit cards or payday. So this is a good point. I don't remember... Now I don't remember. So first of all, you're right. I don't do enough to talk about this issue of, of credit, but I do somewhere in the book to at least make the point once or twice that, right, so I do write, right, right. So later, right, in this chapter, actually, I didn't mention it, but I I, I do point out that, that the... But we'll come back to it because I'm I'm prefacing something that's going to come up in chapter four. That's what that's what. But but the B uh, Bureau for Labor Statistics that I use that 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 the Selig Center and others claim to make reference to, um, to get their numbers because this is this issue of credit is something that I've raised a couple of times uh, before uh, in terms of black people always having some of the most the the highest credit card debt, but specifically. When I asked the spokesperson for the Bureau of Labor Statistics if their data account for purchases, because they 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 tabulate consumer spending, how much did this group spend on whatever, or did they spend at all? And I said, do you count what was spent on credit? Do you count account for that? And they said no. So Craig's point is a good one. Even when you get these big dollar figures of what is mo a good portion of it is credit. So it's not even an expense. So even as I said earlier that the buying power totals are loosely connected to the total money earned, it's even worse than that. It's even less connected to reality than that because a lot of it is based on what people are spending on credit, which is not, and and, and having a credit card debt is not being economically strong. Uh, so you're right. I could I, I, more could be said or done to to make the point about credit, uh, payday loans, et cetera, and so forth. That that's a that's a that's a that's a that's a good one. Um, yeah, the BLS data is, is, is good. It's, and sort of what I'm pointing out in the book is that it, it is being misused and abused, uh, by the Selig Center and then by bad journalism that, that we'll, we'll have a chance to go over when we come to that chapter. Uh, there's a lot of bad journalism, uh, but um, uh, 
Oh, Malele's back. So it's funny that Malele uses the conscious consumer phrase here uh, because, as I point out in the book, and Malele claims to have read the first edition, but I don't think very closely and not not with an eye to understand, but to to find something maybe to critique and maybe because you couldn't, you come back with the empty, vague hate that you did last week. But um, the conscious commuter, consumer phrase is one developed by the propagandists. Specifically, we'll come back to it later in, in, in the book, but this is what, what I want to say was it, 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 it's a Nielsen... Uh, <laughs> yeah, it's a Nielsen. It's a Nielsen. Uh, Nielsen produced a fresh video promoting the conscious consumer campaign featuring black millennials. So, so I. This is my point. So many of the critics of my work are using the propagandized talking points of white capitalists and colonizers. The point, so, so, and we'll come back to it, obviously, but the conscious consumer is the consumer, mostly black, because it's specific to black uh, targeted audiences, who don't want, who, who are conscious by only wanting a symbolic reference to their struggle to encourage a business interaction. They literally make the point that the conscious consumer isn't even necessarily looking for black ownership. They just want a symbol. They want the kente cloth. They want the Black Lives Matter sign in your store. They want the... So, yeah. A truly conscious consumer is a liberated worker probably in a socialist society. <laughs> You can't be a conscious consumer in a capitalist society in the, in, the, in the way that we would understand consciousness here. Now, Malele, who demonstrated last week, is a, is a proponent, is a, is, is a maybe black, a nominally black, a black named, an African named exponent of very white conservative ideas. What's up, Josh? Oh, I've raised this before, but in the chat, but the chat reminded that there needs to be some sort of analysis on monopoly capitalism. I think many of us aren't aware of the stage of capitalism we're in. So, in fact, some of the things that I've been reading uh, uh, in preparing for the second edition, even we're arguing that whether whether it's late stage capitalism or uh, the 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 um, even some are arguing we're still in the consumer capitalist phase that was developed. Um, um, over the last 50, 60 years. Uh, but but um, to me, the stage is important to understand and to identify, but the, 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 the capitalism part, I don't think gets enough of the attention that, that whatever stage of capitalism we're in uh, uh, is, is, is one that is 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 based in exploitation and hostility. Um, uh, so this will be the last the 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 last thing I'm gonna I'm gonna address to Malele, and then I'm just going to 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 disinvite you. Is that I'm gonna just one more time invite you, Malele, to email me your actual argument. Where do I misapply Marxist terms? Where do I get something actually wrong and explain to me with sources and an argument where I can be corrected? Coming into the chat just to throw barbs that are f factually dubious at best, unsupported, uh, is, is just going to get you kicked out. I'm, I, don't, I, don't, I don't either engage the work on a good faith basis or, or, or share your real criticism. Or here, I'll, I'll give you one more opportunity for this as well, since we have a few minutes. Come up here. You don't even have to turn your camera on, but come up here, the link's in the chat, and let's talk through what your criticism is. Break it down. What is the misapplied? 
to me, it's not a waste of time, Craig, because because what Malele is doing is reflecting arguments that I often do get. And I think in demonstrating that they don't have one, there is value in this. So if Malele wants to come up here and demonstrate their their point, I'm happy to hear it. Uh, or you can email me your your fleshed out argument and I'll share it here as well. I don't mind the critique, but I'm not, you're not just going to sit here taking shots at me. What Marxist term did I misapply? We can even just start simply with that if you like. Um, otherwise, we'll just, we, I'll just, I'll just move on. Um, anybody else is welcome to jump up here too, by the way. This is a just for Malele. But, but, uh, I definitely want to make sure that that the critics have a chance to be heard because I want to hear it. I want the legit argument. Now, Malela, you still you still talking you still talking in the chat. You not but you not you not. I don't have an email and I don't have you up here on screen. So, ah, let's see. Wait a second. Oh yeah 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 yeah. It's putting the gloves on. This is the one. Are they saying you shouldn't use Marxist terms to address black issues? I, I don't know. I don't know. And if they are, make it plain. What what is that what you meant, Malele? That I shouldn't use Marxist terms at all to apply? So so you would prefer that we only use white supremacist, colonialist, capitalist terms like conscious consumer, the the very Nielsen. <laughs> The, the Nielsen inspired phrase is that what we should do or maybe or maybe we should use the the uh self definitions and identities imposed on us by co colonization should we refer to ourselves as Americans and Ghanaians and Panamanians and Nigerians is that what we should do should we only you only use the colonizers definitions anyway um <laughs> so seriously but but these are but but these are the responses that I, but i've been getting for years uh because even before i think i identified in the book that 2009 was the first actual commentary i wrote on buying power but there's another at least five if not 10 years of overt i think it's maybe even more than 10 but it's at least 10 i'll say five to 10 years before that of meetings and street conversations and bookstore debates and and this is that's usually what i would get oh you said socialism oh that's that mark stuff i don't want to hear it uh, oh, you don't want to support black business? Up, oh, you're missing. Oh, oh. But what have I actually said? What is the actual argument that that defeats mine? I, I you know. Um, oh, damn. All right, Renee. I'm. I, today is Tuesday. I'm just gonna have to go send it. I, I was sure you got it already. So I will. There's a group of people that I have to have to get the new shipment to. So that is the real question. Where is Renee's book? Exactly. Dr. Ball, my neighbor wants a mall again, wants a mall again and more places to shop instead of going outside of the neighborhood driving 20 minutes away. Oh, wow. My neighbor wants a mall again. Maybe I don't understand. I thought, okay, maybe. Hmm. So, um, how how can an understanding of systemic racism, economic disparities, and social justice be promoted as an alternative to simplistic narrative buying of black buying power? How can I don't know. And again, my book is not even trying to replace the focus on buying power with some other specific focus like what you suggested. I'm just trying to get people to stop believing in the buying power part. And then I think the energy and the the intelligence and the logic can be redirected to find better solutions but i really i haven't figured that out yet 
Uh, Dr. Ball, did you understand my comment about how you discuss stock purchases? I concur with your thesis. No, I don't. I understand what your comment is, but as I said in the, uh, as I said, I just don't agree. In the in the in our comment exchange, I was saying I don't agree. You were telling me that I was wrong, that I don't understand, and I'm just saying I don't agree. It doesn't. You were saying that you were trying to say that because corporations, as we discussed on the remix this morning, uh, can sell back. I think Claudia brought this up, can sell back stock to 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 boost the value of their stock, that that then leaves room for black people or others to buy that stock. So therefore, me saying that uh, 95% of all the stock is already purchased, so what stock is there to buy, still misses my initial point. Your point wildly misses the point I'm making. It First of all, as I'm saying, your very scenario requires what I said. It requires that those who already own the stock be willing to sell it back. In other words, whatever people, if, if you, as I said last week about Jay-Z and Dumbo, for us to be able to make that initial purchase that becomes a, a wealth creating investment, someone has to be there willing to sell what they've already primitively accumulated. Not to misapply another Marxist phrase to black people. It then also misses the point by, by making the ultimate point. Of the, it means that the stock they sell is to make the majority stock that they still retain increase in value. So it doesn't do anything to close the existing gaps. So I don't understand why you would keep coming back with the comments. The, 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 it, the, 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 it also doesn't do anything. It doesn't. It doesn't change anything about the fact that black people don't have any money. So there. So how much could you buy of that stock if it is made available? How many black people could actually buy enough of that stock to have it change their own material conditions? Never mind the conditions of the thirty-nine point nine million rest of us. So I just. That's what I'm saying. It's like. That's why I was saying I fully understand your point. I fully disagree. That's all. <laughs> um what did I, what, I was trying to find the, yeah, Craig, come on. I got a couple minutes. I'll put the link back in the chat. Since Malele's not up here. <laughs> um, Oh, you said pull me up on StreamYard. There, the link's in the chat. Come on. You said that's not what you're saying. That is what you said in the comment, though. You literally said that in the comment on the on the last week's video. But come on here, make it make it plain. Make it plain. I mean, it, and it, you say at least 5000 to make it on the stock market. You need more than that. I mean, the people we're talking about, they're not $5,000. isn't going to catch you up on anything. What's up, Craig? You on here? What's up? Oh, Welcome. How do I hear you? Can you hear me? I hear you. Yeah. Hey, Dr. Ball. So what I'm saying is that the way that you discussed, can you hear me? Yep. Yep. Okay. Go ahead. I have a little delay. Sorry. The way that way that you discussed the uh, the, the purchase of stock is is it, what I was saying is that is wrong because you can buy stock. Your your point about the fact that you can't buy meaningful amounts of stock is accurate. So I'm saying that it's a distraction to say that you can't buy stock. And the <laughs> argument that. You you also make about land. I'm getting some feedback here, so I apologize. I'm getting I'm hearing myself. Uh, 
you make the argument about land purchases, it, it, that is a more apt argument there because land is not it, it increasingly less available. But you can buy stock. We just can't buy enough stock to make a difference. So your thesis is right. I'm agreeing with your thesis. I'm just saying that if you but if the book, but the, I've never argued that you can't buy stock. I think that, that would be. I didn't say you can't buy stock, though, Craig. The book doesn't say that, and I didn't no, say no, you no, can't. No, I'm saying you said that in your. No, 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 no. You said this in an explanation on the video. I'm not saying that's what you're saying in the book. But I'm but saying Craig, that in the video you and and in elsewhere you said you can't buy stock. I've, I, I would defy you to find me a timestamp or a quote where I said you can't buy stock and that was taken and that is said outside of a context of me explaining the broader point because that doesn't it does I obviously I'm not saying you physically or literally cannot buy stock. I'm okay, saying so that we, you can't buy what is already owned and you can't buy what those who already have won't sell to you. So that that fits even within the point you you wanted to intervene to make that they're only selling it to you to benefit themselves and what they're selling to you is not something that can be used to turn into to to to, to close these immaterial gaps. And remember, the context of me referencing land and stocks is in response to the constant refrain and repeated mythology that if black people just bought land and stock instead of hair and rims and weed, we could catch up. And that's false. I don't, I don't disagree with that. Okay. What I'm saying is that when you, if you look at last week's video, when you were discussing this, that's when you, that's when you sort of, you, you left out a step in, ter of your, in terms of your explanation. Okay. All right. I appreciate it. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm, I'm not, we're not, we're not in disagreement. Yeah. Okay. Okay. All right. Cool. So in other words, I'm right. And I'll just take you off the screen with that. <laughs> okay. You got what did Brad Pitt say in, in, in what is it that baseball movie? He said he he hung up on dude. He said when you hear the answer you want to hear, hang up. <laughs> but all right, cool. See that Malele? Do you see that Malele? That's how you do it. Two grown adults said, you know what? I don't agree, or I think we disagree. And it took three minutes. And Craig didn't even have to turn on his camera. And we got clear. You see that? Thank you, Craig. You see that, Malele? Now, how, 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 and, and by Malele, Malele is now my, 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 my euphemism for all of you. The Malele's out there. Malele, I like the name too. I hope I'm pronouncing it correctly because it, it 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 rolls off the tongue nicely. What does Malele mean? What language is that from? Um. Anyway, that was dope. All right, good people. Yeah, don't be a Malele. You know what I'm saying? Although you got Obama on your picture there, I don't know what that means. Uh oh, now I got to worry about now I got now I got worry now I got to worry about you, Black mess of Research. Um. Oh no, what's up, James? Craig said we disagreed on 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 stock purchases, so Craig jumped up on up here for a quick quick second, and we got clear. And the way I remember it, Craig said I was right. So I we I moved on quickly from that. I just, I just, that's. <laughs> but you can hit rewind and check me on that. That might be my fall, failed memory. Um, no, Mutanda is my football player, dude. I know who Mutanda is. And and you know, I, I think I think Mutanda would have come up here and said, yo, I disagree with you. Have you read any Mark Fisher or Zizek about false desires and consumerism? Uh, and it's, and um, I've not read Mark Fisher at all, I think. And Zizek, I've read a few things, his book on violence in particular, some years ago. 
and uh, but I have not, I think, read his anything on consumers and desire. I would like to read. If you got a link, send it to me. I'll admit I can't really watch him anymore. I kind of feel bad about that, but his his and I don't mean any disrespect, but his 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 affectations or whatever um, are a struggle. They're a struggle uh, for me. But but um, Malele, I'm gonna just go ahead and kick you on out there. They're a good person. I'm I'm a little bit a little bit over it today, so I'm gonna go ahead and ask ask Malele to step on out. And if, uh, but if they want to, if they, yeah, they had their mic chance and they can always email me, come on back, send me, send me, do a whole video. I'll sit up here and play the video and go through it. You don't have to talk to me directly. Do a video, post it or send it to me and I'll play it and talk through it. We'll go through. You can lay out the whole thing. You took the time to read the first edition. So you said. You've shown up two weeks in a row, so, you know. Why put in all this time and energy to not grapple with the author or the work itself? I'm not getting it, Malele. <laughs> what would Malele do? <laughs> so, dude, seriously, you've put in all this time and energy. You've typed all these comments. You've read a whole book. You've come back. Two weeks in a row. But seriously, I want the Maleles of the world who have all of this. I mean, I've met so many of them. And they never seem to address what I've actually said or what I'm actually saying. And if I'm actually wrong, I would like to be corrected. I don't need to keep... I know buying power is like my singular thing right now, but I'll find another one. Like Tom Porter says, if you steal my idea, take it. I'm a thinking man. I'll come up with another one. Diverse tribe, what's up? Are you Malele? Oh, they left. I didn't do that. Free Geechee. Come back if you want. I didn't, I didn't, I didn't kick you out. What do corporations do when minority wealth approaches zero? More credit, baby. Black wealth is black wealth is irrelevant to to corporations. All they need is workers with some income who can shop. Black wealth is is basically irrelevant now. It's always been basically irrelevant. So they just need black people to be earning enough money to go back to the store, to go back to the movie, to get that $20 latte and that $17 beer that I got at the stadium. And you can get it on credit. You don't even have to actually earn or have the money yet. Zizek is sharp. No question. I, I don't... I. So I'm happy to read his work. And if there's something specific to, to, to consumerism that I've missed, I'd, I'd definitely like to see it. Um, so yeah, black black corporations don't care if black people don't have any wealth. They're good with that. No, it wasn't watered down. It was in a can. It was a good, it was a good, nice IPA too. It was good. It was definitely not watered down, but it was still $17 and it was still only one. Chitty Bacha, what's up? Hello. Hello. Yeah. Oh, what's up? Yeah. Hi. Yep. I just want to say one thing regarding um even when we do have wealth, so land in a capitalist system, if that's wealth, like I I live in a place where land has been kind of passed down generationally. Some of these neighborhoods are old, but then what's happened in particular after Katrina, I'm in New Orleans. The land the land has two values. It's the structure on top, and then the land underneath the structure has value. So the land is being valued up to the point where people can't afford to pay the taxes. So then we're losing the land like at exponential rates. And so we're not in control of somebody else, say a house that you could buy for 60 grand, maybe 15 years ago is now going for $300,000, $400,000. When your land value has gone up, 
on land on on a even with a house that you maybe necessarily haven't even prepared or I'm sorry repaired over time you can't afford that like it is unaffordable that it's a great point I, I the only thing I could think of is that I remember when we were still in DC we we learned I I didn't realize this but when we bought our house there uh, that's when I learned that you don't actually own the land. You 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 own. I think it's it's it's. I think it's technically like one inch and up. <laughs> like the building is yours. That home you walk into is yours. But the land it's on, it's not. Yeah, the land um, is separately in the in the valley. Yeah. And then I just saw somebody did a new article about uh, or a video I saw that was, you know, riffing off of that. My favorite scene in the film, The Founder, about the the history of McDonald's. They did a whole thing because McDonald's is 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 more uh, it's better understood as a landowner, real estate company than it is a fast food company because they own McDonald's Corporation owns all the land that the individual stores mcdonald's franchises are put on so you can own your franchise but the land that it's on is owned by mcdonald's um and that's how they they that's their primary revenue um anyway just a just a thought yeah so yeah. right on the land is a true value so that's it thank Capital. you very much okay. yeah no i appreciate it thank you thank right you. on no right on anytime thank you very much um. Yeah, but that but to, to the point I was trying to make to Craig, and that's the only reason I mentioned the whole land stuff in the first place. That's one of the main. I mean, again, for years, that's the refrain. Oh, we don't need that struggle. We don't need to do this, that, and a third. We just need to get our money right and and invest in land and stock, land and stock, land and stock, and it's and then you look at it and it's like, wait a minute, wait a minute. That's not how it works. And yeah, I think James was asking, I do like beer that much. I like IPAs that much. But when I go out, I, I go, usually I go, I don't go out often enough. So when I do go out, I go in for the whole bougie thing. Like, you know what I mean? You know, it's, 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 it's like, you know, I don't like window shopping. So if I'm going, I'm going. Otherwise I'm not going. <laughs> you know, so I'll, I'll get one, and and I, my limit is one, so I'll get one. They're not nasty, but it's you know I'm not here to defend the whole you know I I like IPAs a lot, but only one. Only one. And beer is not good if it's not bougie. So there there's the the there is one or two popular IPA brands that pop up at places like stadiums that I will get, but I will not. You will never see me drinking. Name it. Name it. I am a bougie beer drinker at this point, for sure. Um, I admit that. Um, exactly. You can own the block and still not own the land. And so that's another popular phrase. It may be something that I should consider if I come back to another edition. That phrase, buy the block. Buy the block, buy the block, buy the block. Now, Backyard has a great For My Block song. But By The Block is a whole other, oh, no, hell no, zero chance. I will stay sober before I drink that. That's how, that's how, that's how heavy, that's how much I'm anti that. Yuck. You got to check the idea of land patents, some crazy legal shit that is about really owning or not. Own. Yeah, I don't know anything about that, so I will look into that. And if you got links, send them on over. I used to drink Guinness. I used to drink uh, a lot of Guinness, but it's not, I don't, I had one recently. It's not, I've, I've moved on. Bourbon. Okay, all right. Anyway, so uh, anyway, listen, folks, I really do appreciate it. Even the Maleles out there, I appreciate you. Thank you very much. Please do like, share, subscribe, support the entire platform. We got a good 30-minute break now. Go get a snack. 
bio break, get your tea and your coffee, your comfortable chair, uh, whatever you need to get ready for for confronting contradictions. And uh, um, I will see you back on Thursday morning and Friday with EYL and who knows what else is coming up. But uh, uh, there's a lot of great stuff happening on the platform. So make sure you have the bell rung, you like, share, subscribe, all that good stuff. I'm with you, Emma. I'm with you. I'm not mad at that. No alcohol is always a good thing, too. Uh, and um, there you go. Get some cocoa before cocoa. Get your cocoa for cocoa. Cocoa for cocoa puffs. <laughs> um, and thanks a lot. We'll be back next Tuesday, 10 a.m. again for Chapter 3. Uh, and... Uh, yeah, I really appreciate you all. Thank you very much. And like like Fred Hampton used to say, peace if you're willing to fight for it. And catch you next time here at I Mix What I Like it throughout the BPM platform. Thanks again, everybody. Coco for Coco. I mix what I like, 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 what I like.